Industrial Economics, Dyer D. Lum, 1890. I desire to group certain deductions, both critical and constructive, that we may better see the paramount importance of freedom in industrial economics. 1. Division of labor is an outgrowth of social progress, essential to the augmentation of wealth, the evils incidental to it being the result of extraneous causes. And economists, in speaking of limitations and disadvantages of this social law, have shown their incompetence to clearly analyze the essential factors of the industrial problem. It is not in division, but in the subordination of division to privilege, that the economists make the error of ascribing disadvantages to a law evolved in social growth. The element of freedom lacking in exchange, division consequently falls under the control of prerogative, hence the limitations and disadvantages of which economists learnedly prate. 2. Machinery socializes where division isolates. Machinery is to the industrial toiler what the musket is to the militant supporter, a tool by which their respective lines of activity are rendered effective. In the cheapening of products, in the annihilation of time by the telegraph and of space by the railway, and the countless facilities to comfort with which we are surrounded, we see the social results of machinery. Economists never weary of dwelling on the benefits of labor saved by the use of machinery, but gloss over the actual fact that a rapid increase of mechanical appliances tends to render the artisan a superfluous quantity and a marketless tool. Under natural relations, whatever tends to lessen the exhaustiveness of toil and cheapen products should also redound to the direct, no less than the indirect, benefit of the individual laborer. Here again, we find freedom lacking in distribution and are forced to look elsewhere for the cause of the restrictions to ascertain whether they arise from natural causes or artificial interference. 3. Monopoly has been fostered under the delusive pretext of protecting industry by hedging in a portion of human activity at the expense of the rest, and at the same time as zealously protecting the very restrictions of which labor complains. The opposite school, having a partial view of the truth that the law of supply and demand can only have full course under liberty, and that all interference but hampers their natural adaptation to each other, still believed that they were contending under that standard while limiting their demands for freedom of trade to the manufactured product, an error which even Herbert Spencer has not escaped. In asserting theoretical liberty for labor and capital, they are blind to the fact that labor was handicapped inasmuch as the capital employed was the offspring of monopoly. Thus their freedom only enters in after monopolized production has thrown the product on the market and is never conceived as entering into relations prior to production. Consequently, in the present strained relations between capital and labor, we find the freedom of contract a meaningless phrase, and professed apostles of liberty, like Amasa Walker, delivering themselves as follows. In relation to capital and labor, there must be a just proportion of each to the most efficient production, sufficient labor for the capital, and capital for the laborer. So there must be sufficient enterprise, business talent, and tact to use both, and the several parties must be left to act voluntarily, under the instincts of human nature and the laws of value. Footnote. Amasa Walker, The Science of Wealth, a Manual of Political Economy Embracing the Laws of Trade, Currency, and Finance. Boston, Little, 1866, page 281. The text of the quotation has been slightly corrected from Lum's original text to ensure that it matches Walker's. Whether legalization of the lower instincts and the speculative laws now dominant tend to the higher evolution of free action, our apostle of liberty saith not. 4. Competition is the exact opposite, not parent, of monopoly. Freedom is essential to true competition, and wherever restriction exists on one side, it implies privilege on the other. And in so far competition ceases, monopoly rather than competition now exists. In the abrogation of privilege, competition becomes not only free, but acts, as the governor on an engine, self-regulative, and bringing cost as the means of price. Our friends the enemy, the socialists, in flying into a passion at the mention of competition, but 
thereby betray their own logical adherence to the militant camp, for liberty includes and implies freedom to compete. But that cannot in justice be called a competitive system where wages are constantly depressed as with an iron hand as a definite residual dividend, and the divorce between labor and capital justified as calling in an indispensable go-between whose earnings or profits constitute a special or fourth branch of the national income, coordinate with rent, wages, and interest on capital, and hailed as an extension of freedom. Footnote Wilhelm Rorscher, Principles of Political Economy. Translation by John J. Lalore. Two volumes, New York, Holt, 1878. Chapter 2, page 146. 5. The real problem is a far deeper one than enters into the arguments of the advocates of protection and restriction or of a post-production liberty. It is the same as has for centuries past underlain all struggles in social progress, and which, looking back over the centuries, we find recorded as ever one for the sovereignty of the individual, the widening of the sphere of personal initiative, the conflict between militant authority and personal liberty. The renaissance of mind from scholastic tyranny, the revolt of Luther and his followers against mental dictation, the temporary compromise in religious toleration, the insurrection against kingcraft, leading in its triumph to the toleration of political opinions, have now logically led to an insurrection against economic subjugation to the privileges usurped and hotly defended by capital in its alliance with labor, and calling from thinkers of all schools, even from economic Hessian allies, the prediction that unless an equitable adjustment be found— civilization must again go through the parturition pangs of revolutionary strife and bloodshed. By one or other of these antagonistic principles must every proposed solution be tested, and reposing confidently on the historical development of progress, wherein even the man of genius is but the secretary of his age, we assert that no answer can be given to the eternal conflict that is not based upon full freedom to human activity." for freedom destroys strife by removing its cause, denial of freedom. With these deductions for our guide, we begin the search for economic laws based upon justice, enlightened by wisdom, supported by truth, in which alone industry can find its goal in equitable cooperation. Taking these, therefore, as the basis of industrial economics, rather than laws describing modes of action under inequitable conditions, we have been led to demand for labor. 6. Free land, that labor in its struggle shall not forever find the source of production the ward of monopoly, and thus left upon as unequal a footing to compete in production as existed between the slave and his master. That as land is the source of production, its real or natural value lies in its use, not what it will bring where privilege exists to give it a fictitious value. One of the effects of this would be the elimination of rent as a necessary prelude to occupancy, or a factor in the distribution of the shares of production. That under freedom of access to vacant land and the spring it would give to production, labor would determine a juster proportionality of values between products, wherein alone real value exists. We see in nationalization of land but a recurrence to militancy in its methods, and its application beset with many fatal compromises. To one who accepts authority, rather than liberty, as a guiding principle, the conclusion may be natural, but to one who endeavors to square his principles by the test of liberty, whether land can be called private property or not, after it has ceased to be a factor in economic exploitation, is immaterial. Liberty cannot deny the calling of one's possession of anything his own. It is in the power given by legalization to hold for speculative purposes, not particular possession for occupancy, that the danger to civilization lies. We also submit that making it common property involves invasion of individual freedom to use, for it can be neither so made nor so maintained except by militant methods, whether under George's or Most's attempted organization of liberty. 7. Free exchange would break the monopoly now possessed by currency, the instrument of exchange, and also could open full use of the possession of land. Today the small retail dealer cannot compete with the merchant prince in the purchase of goods, any more than the mechanic who buys his coal by the bushel enters into competition with one who buys his year's supply by the cargo. 
Has the workman equal freedom to compete with the employer of labor? Can hands enter the market on equal term with the wealthy contractor? But why not? Because behind the capitalist, as we now find him, privilege lends support which transforms the result of honest industry into a hideous Moloch standing with outstretched arms to receive as a sacrificial victim the toilers who have made that capital possible. The legalized power given to money determines the difference. It makes it more than the mere instrument of exchange. It becomes an implement of exploitation, having a fictitious value, and culling from industry to increase by payment for use. Thus claiming that yesterday's labor is more than wealth acquired, and through interest entitled to prerogatives not granted to today's labor, but even taken from it. We thus see that it is not capital per se that liberty assails, but the artificial power it usurps, that under equal freedom, where no privilege exists to entail exploitation, it is as harmless as we have seen private property would be. Capital itself is man's best friend, the true social savior that opens the march of progress and that has transformed society from warlike to peaceful pursuits. But under the crucifying hands of legalization, where prerogative mocks at penury, its mission is thwarted and it becomes a ravenous beast. As Satan is said to have once been an angel of light, so in the denial of equal freedom to the capitalization of the fruits of labor, capital has become a demon of hell, and beyond the power of redemption by single-tax sanctification. 8. Mutual banking, we have seen, would open the door for relief. In the absence of artificial restraint upon individual activity, that everyone in possession of returns for labor applied, endorsed by business capacity or not, whether individually or by association, could command credit to the extent of their honestly acquired wealth, or confidence in their pledge of labor force, and use their own labor as a basis for increased production. Whether production would then be individualistic or associative, on which the author has strong convictions, would not in the least alter the case. Freedom to normal growth secured, its natural course is a detail which would regulate itself. The fact remains that under release from compulsory rent and cessation of usury, energy and capacity would be more assiduously cultivated and command greater confidence than a state certificate for honesty, and thereby create an ample medium for exchange based on labor products. To doubt it is to assert that capacity and energy, together with inventive talent, can only germinate where exhaustive mental or manual labor most exist, and where rest and recreation are least known. Credit would be a matter of confidence in both security and character, and character would be as essential an element then as shrewdness and cunning are now. Business, emancipated from inequitable conditions, would continue as uninterruptedly as under the present system of a mortgage security on the source of production where labor toils for another's benefit, and the benumbing effect of a Frankenstein state no longer repress individuality nor inspire the superstitious with awe. Insurance or security. Under equal freedom, wherever demand exists, supply necessarily will be forthcoming, and guarantees for security will arise as easy as guarantees for politeness in the ballroom or parlor. Under equal opportunities, wherever mankind are thrown upon their own resources, when being fed from a spoon by government pap shall have become a traditionary tale of a past superstition, what is there in the power of activity that cooperative enterprise cannot undertake? We now see on every hand a thousand instances of voluntary association to attain certain objects. Many such deemed impractical a few centuries since are commonplaces today. Who will say the limit has been reached? Even in functions government assumes as necessary, we find voluntary militia and home guards, fire departments in many places in which all members risk their lives and turn out in all weather to render the lives and property of their neighbors secure associations of private watchmen who find support even though their patrons pay taxes for municipal police protection, a fire patrol in the interests of insurance companies to protect property from destruction. These are instances of cooperation applied to guaranteeing security, of supply-seeking demand without difficulty or friction, a demand by no means dependent upon legalization, but supplementing its deficiencies. All relations under equal freedom will tend to become associative when and where it is seen to be most effective. 
Freedom for the individual cannot be construed into compulsory isolation. What is even now done by wealthy mill owners may be done by all when equal opportunities to exploit nature shall have removed special privileges to exploit fellow men, when cooperation in all needed relations lies open before us and labor enjoys its full just share of the wealth or values it creates. With its resultant release from rent, interest, profits, and taxation as enforced tribute, the causes for vice and crime would rapidly diminish, for free access to nature would open to all more than a competence, and in ease give greater scope to the purely human sympathies for the unfortunate. And so far as protection from the still vicious and idle is concerned, an extension of the scope of insurance can meet all requirements. An organization for protection to person and labor product, or property if you will, composed of those who felt the need for the exercise of such functions, in which loss by depredation would involve no greater difficulty than loss by fire, would naturally arise where such demand existed. The difference between the watchmen of such an organization, whose functions consist in mutual protection and defense of the equal limits of personal freedom for commercial needs, and a political policy system wherein personal liberty is subordinated to inanimate things as of a greater importance than their creators, is so apparent to the candid reader that I need not pause to dwell upon it. Progress and order is the true expression of social evolution, rather than the reverse, for law is ever fixity, and its resulting order but uniformity wherein progress finds its grave. Order based upon progress, on the contrary, ever retains the plasticity essential to the latter, and this can only be realized in the further evolution of the law of equal freedom required by the industrial type. Such is anarchy.